CR, it's really good to see you. You were the 27th winner of the Walt McDonald first book in poetry with the Lime Letters, which was chosen by our intrepid series editor, Rachel Menes, whose infallible eye continues to guide that series to this day. We're really glad to have you. Um, we're here gathered today because um, we're talking about the audiobook for the Lime Letters, which is out and available for free on some platforms and for not free on the platforms which I cannot control and which you can probably guess and which I will not name herein. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the nature of, of poetry as audio stuff and, and other itinerant things. And then I thought we could listen to some things and react to them and see what we think. And so the first question I wanted to bat at you has to do with readings versus reading. And I've known poets who really view readings as almost the primary text, like they're poets because they go to readings or because they perform at readings. And for them, that is the primary locus of poetry. I've also known poets who just really hate readings. They don't like the sort of almost actory components and they feel as though the, the true way to encounter a poem is as it is written. And so I wonder if you can take that false dichotomy and plot yourself on it somewhere. What sort of poet are you? Um, yeah, thanks for asking. And I will say I've been good and not listen to the recordings at all. So it'll be like a true reaction. Um, I'm kind of nervous about it actually. Yeah, I <laughs> I'll situate myself in this yeah, yeah, yeah. three part tradition now. So I think that like for me, um, poetry, I, I like to think about with the poem or poems, how the tradition began having form because it helped people memorize it because that people don't have access to printed poetry. So people would basically create like poems with like rhyme and rhythm because it was easier for your body to catch on to that and then repeat it through generations. And there would be like changes over time but like that kind of physical communal act of like using your body, including sound to like convey what's happening, and like letting some of that physical piece do the work, I think is like at the core of poetry for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I'd say it goes so far as to say the primary text is reading in front of an audience and performing it yeah. so much as being able to like read it back to myself and feel that thing that I think is like a little bit ephemeral or like past what you can see on a page. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've been chasing that for a long time. Like, I think I have a line in one of the poems in here that's like words cannot move like I used to move. Um, and so I think it's also like a disability studies yeah. praxis of like, oh, I can't physically move to express myself the way I could before getting really sick and developing some disabilities. And poetry became a genre where the kind of physicality of trying to like feel out the sounds felt like it mirrored some of that, even if it failed to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think less the theatrical, but more like the physicality of it to me. Yeah. Is what yeah, and that and I think that's a good distinction because the theatrical versus the physicality. Because I always think of someone who's really um, oriented towards reading also is exerting more control over the tone and the reception of the poem like you can as a reader choose to read something funny to read something sad to uh draw out something in sort of an achingly resonant way and i i wonder then if you are still making the aural experience um, and thinking of it privately the private aural experience of poetry then does reading something out loud play into your process of composition then if you're tweaking if you're editing do you um, hear it out loud to yourself to help make decisions yeah 100 percent um i'll use a more like recent poetry project as an example because it's kind of silly um but i was i would go to churches and like um because i was raised really like super religious and like i would i'll go in and i'll sit down and i'll write kind of everything i'm hearing like the pastor i'll write things i'm seeing in the verses they're referencing i'll write what other people are saying um and then i'd go home and shape it into a poem and then i'd find the verse and i would scan it meaning i'd like look at what the rhythmic pattern is of that like scripture 
and I take the shaped text that I just made and try to force it to imitate that rhythm and imitate some of the sounds. Um, and then I take that <laughs> and try to imitate the sound that like the kind of ups and downs and volume and tone and rhythm that the pastor was using yeah. to kind of try to make the message. So by the time I'm done, the poem is like completely inseparable from my own like physical mm -hmm. experience, both intentionally mm -hmm. and maybe like inadvertently, depending on the moment of getting those words down. And then one of them, I took it another step further because I was like not wanting to have to write something new. So I was like, I'll keep tweaking this one thing. Yeah. And I put a Taylor Swift song on repeat and I changed the meter again or the rhythm again to match the rhythm of the song. So that each line is the same um, rhythm as the line in the Taylor Swift song. Cause it just seemed very funny to me to take like, you know, this very traditional text and then completely make it just pop culture-y and maybe problematic in different ways. Um, and I think with this book, with the Lime Letters, I was writing it during my MFA mostly. And so I would just do this in a simpler way. I'd write the poem and I'd scan it. So I'd track what the metrical feet were and then I'd play around with enforcing a certain rhythm to it, um, if that makes sense and see what came out of it. It does. I, I think that one of the things that becomes clear both in reading the line letters and in talking to you is how indissociable like the composition process is from the reading experience. And so that leads me into the next sort of final question before we actually listen to some poems, which is that this was a both a COVID project and a communal project, meaning that you, while the process was very deliberate, you were willing to um, let other people um, bring their processes to the reading. Um, the 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 audiobook has multiple readers. And I wonder if you can talk about just the origin of the decision to do it that way and what was it that, because you have so much control over it and now you don't. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it actually. Um, I hadn't thought of it as like letting go of control. I guess like I didn't ever want the control in the first place. I think that like, I'm very afraid of like, and it's the same when I read in person, I tend to cut it short. Yeah. Like if it's been 10 minutes, whether I read all the poems I want to read or not, I'll usually stop. Um, because I'm very afraid of like falling into my own traps of like using the same sounds over and over, whether it fits the poem or not, and like boring myself. Hmm. And so I was like, well, I've heard my voice a lot. Like, I think I've, I've between like projects I've done at the UW for English department and the Simpson Center and then the, the poetry blog, I have like hundreds of audios out there, like recordings out there on the internet. I'm very sick of my voice. I also teach and record my teaching. So like part of it was just selfish of like, I just need to not hear myself anymore. Yeah. And then some of it was like wanting to be like surprised and excited and inspired by like what sounds happen when like someone's stepping into the poem without all of the kind of baggage of crafting it. Yeah. And like wanting to kind of experience that sound. And then some of it was like, I feel like R, this kind of character in the book, isn't really singular. Like they're not like one voice. They're not a mono voice person. So yeah. it felt very false to then have like just my voice, which is not trained in taking on multiple voices, yep. read all of these letters. It felt like ironic in a bad way. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like, no, like, you know, R is very invested, I think, in like dispersing like their position in the world and thinking about like all these different beings that make them who they are. And so it felt truer to like the character, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and then I definitely didn't want it to fall into still being like the baggage of poetry readings placed on it. So I wanted it to be people that aren't even published poets and sometimes aren't even interested in poetry um, to hear like what sounds happen if they read it. Um, so I could go on and on about it, but, and yeah. there's also the ethics, right, of, like, community building and reciprocity and thinking about ways that, like, we aren't really one voice ever as individuals, like, we're kind of a composite of all the things we hear and take in and then produce from that, yeah. um, so it seems, yeah, it just seemed truer, if that makes sense. It does, and with that, let's listen to some. Okay. All right, we're going to, if you're following along, we're on page... <laughs> We're on page 18, um, my dearest of furred companions, one of these poems. We'll start with this and then we will chat about it. My dearest of furred companions, Mont Blanc. 
I adore your gray, small sea so much, my lovely little ball of velvet nesting in my green-lined bones. Clear your beads of black and cloud a-gazing on me. True, I see your shedding come upon me. Waves like Sarish seas, soft sands. It sticks. It gets in soup. It makes me cannibal to eat you daily. Sink your healing teeth into my open palm like kibble bits. It's written with rhyme. I'll get a new companion. You will love as paws on sun-tanned lawns, and loving you will just adore his flopping ears beneath your batting practice. Daily swipes at bugs like ticks on tile. Protector. May we always want to snuggle. May we kill beneath my fumes of tea so softly steeping. Mine who purrs, and mine when prone. I lay or lie or snore. R. So now you have been the audience <laughs> to your own poem. And I, I wonder if you could just talk about the experience of that. This is something you yeah. wrote, but now someone else has rewritten, kind of. Um, <laughs> and so who are you now? Are you a reader? Are you a writer? Who are you? I mean, to add another layer, in case I don't already Stop like that. mess everything up, uh, Colleen's the reader, Colleen Burner, which I forgot until I started hearing the voice come through. Mm -hmm. And Colleen did the visual art for my chapbook. Um, oh. So we've also collaborated <laughs> across mediums. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it was interesting because I'm hearing it and all I hear is Colleen. And like Colleen's also owns a cat and we, we swap cat pictures a lot and cat videos. I asked Colleen to read all of the letters to pets mm. um, because of Colleen's like own relationship to animals and Colleen's own novella on like animality. Yeah. Um, so actually when I'm hearing it, R became Colleen and Colleen became R and I'm, and I, Colleen and I were just becoming friends when I wrote this poem too. And I don't think that like I've ever thought about how much did this poem actually happen because of that friendship. Let's <laughs> listen to another one and um, and go from there. This was the one on page 49, my dearest mare out to pasture. Set that up. My dearest mare out to pasture, broken phone line and covered tracks. I will not. Pick up your bones. I will not pick up your bones. I will not pick up your bones. A foot tremor, only the living cause dust. I do not want you in my bones, and with everything red, how can I circle you? This is how I know I am not an elephant. Gray skin folds and a foot make dust. The ivory waits, broken clean from the river. Ivory is only ivory, under a full sun. My heels will not touch your skull. My heels will not touch your skull, my heels, and I wait for you with my animal machines. But are you really dead? I wait for you to show me how dusted down you really are. What dust collected before they arrived. Glasses askew, empty orange bottle and a carpeted stair, one curl splitting from the head and a fat fold filled pantyhose, one stair and a phone on the hook. My heels will not touch your skull. My heels will not touch your skull. Ivory covers me. I can finally see the use of dust. I can see it now how I will not be yours, how I will not pick up your bones, are. Oh, um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's Patrick Millian. I think I've done, we used to have a segment on the poetry blog, Patrick and Pop Culture. <laughs> <laughs> where we would do poems together um, at the end of my at the end of my doctoral program. Uh, Patrick's a modernist, and I had forgotten. I've looked at this poem enough times. I'd forgotten why this was the way it was. It's because I was obsessed with Gertrude Stein, 
And I, Patrick actually was given a choice of which series to read and chose this series. And at the time I was like, really? <laughs> That's what you picked. And now like hearing yeah. him read it, I'm like, oh, it's actually so angry. And I can like, I can hear like an angry Gertrude Stein in it that I don't think that like I even realized was in it <laughs> until I hear Patrick reading it, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. I mean, I, I would never have thought about you in the context of modernism, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, that's really especially an interesting point of contrast with, I think, the pure textural experience of reading it and seeing the way it's laid on the page versus it's so much more sparse um, orally, I think. And that's a really that poem is so different um heard versus read readers are making decisions as they read some people like patrick did read through the lines and sort of syntactically others like view the end of a line as more of a hard stop and people are making decisions as they go what do you do if how do you react when people make a decision that you wouldn't have if they get something wrong or I, I guess, how do you view those decisions that, that readers have to make here? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think I think of it as wrong. I think it's more like, maybe this is just more reflective of my own self-doubt. <laughs> 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 like, you know, some people externalize and I tend to internalize. Yeah. So if it's like totally different than what I intended, which yeah. I don't have a whole lot of intent when I'm writing, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. then I tend to be more like, oh, maybe I need to change the poem because mm. clearly that didn't stick um but like I don't I think I'm I don't think I think it is wrong I think it's like exciting to me because it means yeah. that it is like I'm very excited when there's like possibilities for multiple ways to do something or understand okay. it. so I think like for me it's like this is a poem that I'd always read opposite of the other one as quieter and actually having a lot less form like rhythmically yeah. I don't think I've ever read this in person and then like hearing Patrick read it, it was like angrier and it was louder yeah. and it was a much more like, like um, pointed and like there was a lot less spaciousness, I think, in the way he read it than when I read it to myself. Yeah. Um, and actually like that felt truer. Like this is a poem about a family member who has like shaped the legacy of like evangelical Christianity in my family and like cycles of abuse, maybe more than like anyone else since I was born, like in my living life. Mm -hmm. And like the, the kind of like pain and anger of that legacy is so intense um, that like, especially the homophobia and like thinking about, you know, if someone dies and they've, they've shaped the way they're like their own kin think, how dead are they, you know? um and kind of like yeah so I think that like I this is another poem where I'd kind of like abandoned it a bit sometimes because like in MFA workshops a poem will get hit really hard with people yeah. being like, no I hate this you know and then you're like oh I guess it is garbage mm -hmm. um but I think this is one where like hearing Patrick read it I felt myself getting angry again <laughs> mm -hmm. at like that person and like feeling that kind of pain again and I think it's because he kind of broke away from like how I read it in my own head as quiet and mm -hmm. like dusty you it's, know? it's an interesting um almost conundrum to be put in as a reader where you're hearing um, something that came through a very deliberate and very personal process is still sort of anonymized by turning experience into poetry. But now it seems as though hearing your own personal poems refracted through people that you know has almost like repersonalized it in a way. Because when, when I read the Lime Letters initially, when we were sort of hammering out the layout, like I'm not going to say it was impersonal, but it felt a little more there were uh, more detachment, more um, layers of irony or wordplay or um, jokes, uh, really, uh, even. And, and that was one of the things that I remember about my first read through. That has not been our experience today in listening to it. And so I, I wonder what you make of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the one that Colleen read, I think is a kind of dry humor poem. Yeah. It's like talking about like a cat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. romanticizing the cat's shedding and being very like melodramatic and like Shakespearean about the yeah. experience of drinking tea with your cat you know there's a sort of like self-reflective like self-deprecating humor I think almost and this one is not humorous mm. 
I think. Um, and so I think that like some of the humor of the cat poem seemed to disappear a bit. I took it less, like yeah. I found myself making fun of myself and making fun of Arliss, hearing it reread through this very like compassionate <laughs> and like tender voice. And then like similarly with this one that I see is very removed, like how far away from like being angry and grieving from you can I get? Yeah. Um, like literally I will not, you know, <laughs> being like angrier and have, and like sadder at the same time somehow and like less removed and like dusty. Yeah. Um, so it is, yeah, it is. I, I think that it is like repersonalizing them somewhat. It might be easier to feel compassion for R when it's not in my own voice because of my own issues yeah <laughs> I'm realizing <laughs> yeah. I'd love to pretend I'm like a disembodied poet just analyzing my poems but I'm not oh these aren't me at all yeah <laughs> yeah. Speaker. Yeah, yeah exactly and I'm yeah. like oh yeah there's like a lot of pain here yeah. you know um and so that in and of itself is interesting and in a lot of a lot of other ways, the sort of the relative intimacies that poetry is and is not, and false intimacies and refracted intimacies, and in this case, repackaged intimacies. So, yeah. and so, so some of the readers I'm not close with at all, actually. They're like colleagues. Yeah. Like, I don't think we know anything about each other's personal lives, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so it, it really is a range. Like, you happen to pick the two two of the people I'm the closest with, mm -hmm. actually, out of the whole, like, audio yeah, that's interesting. Um, Given the, all right, I'm going to let this wind up. Um, somewhere in the link near this video, I will uh, redirect you to if you are interested in obtaining this audiobook yourself. And of course, the Lime Letters you can purchase from your local independent bookstore or through the TTU Press website or the other place. I won't tell. Um, other than that, see, I really appreciate you taking the time to react. And this is a, a, a unique way to experience poetry. And I'm glad we got to do it together.